And these PowerPoints should be available on Moodle, but let's spend some time talking about internal dosimetry. And what you'll find is your reading has really just kind of prepared you for this discussion. It's given you some basic terminology. Um, we're going to get into some more specific stuff and define some really precise terms here. But we want to illustrate different types of nuclides and discuss common notations. So some of that may be like a review from like chemistry. Then we're going to chart activity of radioactive decay and discuss various types of, radio of decay. So some of that might be a review from like physics. Um, and then we're going to solve problems related to activity, decay, and half-life. And that's all very clearly physics. And then we'll discuss the factors in committed dose and MERD calculations. So this is now the biological aspect of it. So we're kind of moving from chemistry to physics to biology and all in one fell swoop. So a nuclide, if, if you're never sure about whether something is a radio, radio nuclide, radio pharmaceutical, whatever, you can never be wrong calling it a nuclide, right? Uh, it's kind of an umbrella term. And so we will describe nuclides by talking about the number of protons. So we'll, we'll refer to that as its atomic Z number. And we might also think about the neutron number because the Z number plus the N number, the, the neutrons versus plus the protons, are going to be what give us the um, total number of protons and neutrons, which is the atomic mass number, or A. So in this formula, the atomic mass number just equals protons plus neutrons. Sometimes we'll use different symboliz ways to symbolize nuclides. And so uh, these, these three um, nuclides here are forms of hydrogen, right? So if it's just one proton, then we're talking about a normal old hydrogen atom, right? If we add a neutron in there, we have uh, deuterium. And then if we add a proton and two neutrons, now we have tritium. Tritium is radioactive, right? And so it's going to do things to try to get back to that stable state of hydrogen. And so often, though, for simplicity's sake, we'll ignore the atomic number and follow the symbol of the element with the atomic mass number. So like tritium, we might also write as just H-3, right? Or we might just call it hydrogen 3. So there's three types of nuclides, and if you look at your chart, I've kind of indicated how they, how they relate to each other on this chart. Um, there's isotopes, so these are different nuclides with the same number of protons. Okay, So the, the series of hydrogen atoms that we just looked at would all be isotopes of each other. Um, and we mentioned that one of them was radioactive, so we could call it a radioisotope. Right? But they're all atoms of hydrogen. Isotones would be different nuclides with the same number of neutrons. So, for example, if we had tritium and then helium-4 and then lithium-5, all of those have the same number of neutrons. And so isotones on this periodic table of the nuclide chart um, are going to be in the same column. Isotones exist in the same column. And so you can actually see that if you, if you track... Um, hydrogen here, hydrogen 3, here's tritium. If you follow it across and then go up, you can see there's helium 4, lithium 5, um, boron 7, carbon 8, right? Again, some of these nuclides exist in nature, some of them don't, some of them are theoretical, right? Um, isobars are really difficult to identify apart from the chart. With the chart, the chart makes it very easy to identify these. But these are different nuclides with the same atomic mass number, right? So, for example, helium or hydrogen three and helium three, and so they are diagonally um, related to each other. So we can move diagonally on the chart, and we will call those isobars. So here is um, the chart of the nuclides, and I want to zoom in on this thing real quick, and then I'll and then I'll zoom back out. 
but we can see it is a much bigger periodic table than the old classic periodic table that you had in high school chemistry. It's huge, and you have to pay a good amount of money to get a poster form of it, and it would cover probably that section of wall over there between the paneling and the, the corner if it was, you know, legible, if each little square was legible. Um, so there's different ways that we can represent it, but the significant thing here is that there's a line of stability. There's a line of stable um, nuclides, and then a, departing from either side of these stable nuclides, there's going to be radionuclides. There's going to be different isotopes that are radioactive. Some of them may be not radioactive, but are still isotopes. So this initially was developed by Emilio Segre, and it has a checkerboard appearance where each square represents a different nuclide. And so, like we talked about, the rows are going to be the protons or the atomic number. So on our little chart here, this one row, row number one, is all hydrogen, right? And so that row, they all have the same number of protons. So they're all hydrogen atoms, right? The next row up, helium, they're all helium atoms on this row. The columns indicate neutron number. And so as we move up and down the columns, we have different isotones. And one easy way to remember that difference between isotopes and isotones it's isotopes has a P, and so it's talking about protons, right? Isotones has an N, it's talking about neutrons. I don't know how you remember isobars. I guess it's the one that just is different. Um, so the most basic thing that this chart does is help us distinguish the stable nuclides from the not stable ones, and the way it does that is with color. The stable nuclides are gray, right? And these gray, you can kind of faintly see it here, but I'll, I'll zoom back in. These gray um, checkerboards form that line of stability, right? And it's actually kind of a slightly curved-shaped line. But we can see sections of the line of stability here on this little piece of the chart that we have. Right? And if we turn the page, we can see um, how confusing the line of stability gets as we get higher up in atomic number. But... Uh, Unfortunately, the colors didn't transfer over very well. I can no longer tell what's stable in this area because there's other colors on the chart. Okay. I don't really need to worry about the other colors on the chart for right now. Just understand the gray ones are good. You don't have to worry about them irradiating you. So radioactive decay is any movement that a nuclide makes to, to get back to that line of stability. All of these things would prefer to be stable. Um, and so they're going to make a number of energy exchanges in order to become stable. And during decay, a radionuclide changes its number of protons and neutrons to a more stable condition. And so, in essence, it becomes a different nuclide. Sometimes it even becomes a different atom of a different element. Um, which is kind of crazy when you think about it. I, I think I've shared this example with you all in the past. I almost had Gargamel on this slide, right? Um, if, if anyone was a big fan of the Smurfs growing up, Gargamel is the wizard in that, and he's always trying to catch the Smurfs. Do you all remember why he's trying to catch the Smurfs? Anyone who was a fan of the Smurfs? Or, I'm just totally up a creek right now. No one watched the Smurfs. Okay, I like the Smurfs. What Gargamel was interested in, the reason he wanted the Smurfs is because he could turn the Smurfs into gold, right? So this was um, part of an ancient set of pseudoscience called alchemy, right, that believed that if you could find the philosopher's stone, you could transmute lead or other substances into gold, right? Um, we now have that power. We can turn things into gold, right? That power is essentially radioactivity. Um, it is in some ways on a line with the occult is what I'm saying. It's, it's strange stuff. Um, it should be treated with some respect. So, Largely, what happens in this is because of the th what theory of relativity teaches us, and matter is neither created nor destroyed, anytime a atom becomes a different atom, it releases quite a bit of energy, right? So the, the destruction or the, some of this mass of the atom will be transferred into energy, right? And that energy, a lot of times, is what we're talking about when we're talking about radioactivity, although some of it's also heat and light and things like that. Um, like within a 
radioactive core of a nuclear power plant, it actually glows blue because it's emitting certain colors of light and things like that. So de decay represents a move towards that line of stability that releases quite a bit of energy. So here are the major types of decay. We'll, call it, we'll talk about beta decay, and sometimes it's represented with that B and a little negative. So when I'm talking about beta decay, I'm going to call that uh, beta negative. Sometimes people refer to it as beta negative. In this case, an electron is quote-unquote born in the nucleus, and what happens is a neutron actually gives off an electron, and in the process of giving off an electron, turns into a proton, right? Because a neutron is what? Neutral. So if a neutral thing gives off a negative thing, it becomes positive, right? That's weird. Um, so this will cause the atom to move one box up and to the left on our little chart, right? So if I have, we can, we can now use this information to figure out when tritium decays, when H3 decays, what does it become? Helium-3. It becomes helium, right? So it essentially becomes stable, immediately becomes stable. It doesn't have to go through any other decay processes. It becomes stable. So it moves up and to the left. For alpha decay, and sometimes it's symbolized with this little Greek sign alpha, um, a particle is given off and that particle is actually a helium nucleus, right? So it has, um, it has uh, all the things that are inside of a helium atom, but it lacks the electrons, right? So it has two protons, two neutrons. Um, and very few alpha emitters have atomic numbers less than 83, and we typically do not use them for medical applications. And the main reason for that is because this, these alpha particles are high let, and the amount of energy that they give off is given off very rapidly within a few microns of distance, and they're very, very difficult to detect. Um, they, we would not, we would have, a, we'd have a difficult time detecting a pure alpha particle emitter with a Geiger counter. It's not designed to detect those. We have to use different kinds of detectors to find those. So we do not typically use alpha particle emitters for medicine. That's good news. Um, when alpha particle decay occurs, it's going to move diagonally down uh, to, to the left. Okay? Two down to the left. Um, we're not going to be able to look at that when we're talking about like uh, helium, but for its for our purposes in terms of alpha particle decay, we can identify if we've said that there's a line of stability, and anytime one of these things goes through a radioactive decay process, it's trying to move towards the line of stability, and we've said that these alpha particles move diagonally down to and to the left. Can they be below the line of st stability? No, because they're trying to move toward the line of stability. So alpha particle emitters will always be above the line of stability, and they're going to be moving down towards it. Okay. Um, the same is also true for positron decay, also t sometimes called beta positive decay. In this case, a positron is born from the nucleus. So this is a like an electron having the same mass as an electron, but a positive charge. It is emitted out of a neutron, and in the process, that neutron converts um, into a neutron. I'm sorry, it's, it's emitted out of a proton, which is converting itself into a neutron, and in the process, also produces a neutrino. Right? The only thing I want to say about positron decay or beta positive de decay is it's fairly complicated stuff, and um, for the bulk of the students who are in this class, I don't know that we need to drill down a lot into that. Um, the beta negative decay is probably the one that we can focus most of our intention on. Um, but the one exception to that rule is technetium 99. 
M, sometimes called 99M for metastable. Um, it is a, it does go through beta positive decay, and in the process, when it emits that positron, that positron is going to go through an annihilation reaction with an with an electron, right? And in the process, it's going to produce two 511 keV photons traveling in opposite directions from each other. Why is that important? Why is that important? Yeah, PET. This is PET. So when we talk about positron emission tomography, we're talking about the detection of photons having that specific characteristic. It's not going to have 513 keV energy. It could potentially have a little bit less than that if it goes through some kind of scatter event. But we're going to detect these two photons very rapidly traveling in opposite directions, 180 degrees opposite each other, and we're going to say, okay, that occurred there. We're going to, we're going to backtrack to where that um, annihilation event must have occurred. So tech, technetium-99M, techni tech 999 metastable is the one exception to that for us. Occasionally we... Another form of this is electron capture. This is very similar to positron decay, but in this case, a nucleus of an atom actually sucks an electron out of its own electron cloud into the neutron, into the nucleus, and a proton is then converted into a neutron. So same result, a, a proton's converted into a neutron, um, and it's going to move diagonally uh, down and to the right, just like with beta positive decay but it is not producing a positron. It's just capturing one of its own electrons. And then another form, and it's very important to us, is this gamma ray emission, right? This is primarily what we want to mess around with for nuclear, uh, for nuclear medicine and for most therapeutic purposes is playing with the gamma ray emission. Because when we're talking about these particles, right, when we're talking about alpha particles, beta particles, all that kind of stuff, they have the potential to get very messy, right? Gamma rays are fairly clean. They're just like x-rays. The only thing that they differ in is their point of origin. X-rays are produced inside of an x-ray tube. Gamma rays are produced through these radioactive decay processes, okay? So gamma rays are electromagnetic radiation emitted from the nucleus when it moves to a lower energy, when, it's, when it de-excites, okay? And it's typically a two-step process. The nucleus decays and remains in a, an excited state, and then it gives off a gamma ray as it de-excites, okay? One example of this is radon. The way that radon works is it will go through a decay process, and then it's going to de-excite and give off a gamma ray. So it has a very short window of time where it's a different form of radon before it de-excites. So let's talk about activity, decay, and half-life. I know this is kind of a busy slide, but I, I know that this is a point where folks frequently get confused, and so I wanted to concentrate this stuff into a single slide so that you could see step-by-step step how people arrived at these formulas, where these formulas are helpful, and how they kind of correspond with each other. Okay? And then we're going to look at my very stupid caveman way of doing this math. So if, if you think this kind of math is hopeless, you're never going to figure out how decay products and stuff like this work, um, I've got some good news for you because there is actually a stupid way to do this stuff. Um, and, but I want to show you kind of the scientific way first. Okay? So activity, A. So forget what I said about atomic numbers or whatever. A for our purposes means activity. Okay? Um, and it's the decay rate of a specified radionuclide. So if we have, uh, again, a amount of tritium, right, we are talking about its activity, wh at what rate it will decay. Um, and then we can talk about the probability of decay. And decay sometimes we symbolize with this lambda sign, right? of any one atom at any given time in that sample, right? So we've got a bunch of tritium, right, floating around in this room, let's say. Um, and the d probability of decay is the chance that any one of those atoms floating around this room will go through this decay process in, in hopes of being stable. 
Now, anyone who's ever worked around this stuff will tell you, when you hold a Geiger counter to this, up to a source, it's not going to make a nice, it's not going to be like beep, 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 beep. It's not going to sound like your heart monitor, right? It's going to be a randomized set of beeps, right? It's going to be like beep, 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 beep. Beep, 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 You know, it's random. It's completely random process, okay? So what we're talking about is chance. What's the fancy word for chance when we're talking about stuff, risks, and things like that? Starts with an S. And the next second letter is a T. Stochastic. This stuff undergoes a stochastic process, right? We said that cancer is a stochastic risk process. So the same kind of quote-unquote random process we will refer to as stochastic, which Robbie is right, it is, it does come from statistics. Um, and it ha and in, our, in the case of decay, it will have units of inverse time. So it'll be like seconds to the negative one, right? Days to the negative one, per day, per hour hour to the negative one. All of those things are interchangeable, right? And those are just the units in which we will just express this decay constant, okay? So now we have activity and we've gotten kind of fancy with it. We've got a certain amount of the material, right? So that's right here, a certain amount of material D times N, the number of the material, and then we have D times time, a duration of time. Okay? So activity equals a, a deterioration in the number of atoms divided by an amount of time. Okay? We said that the probability of decay is random, and so activity, if it's equal to this amount of material divided by an amount of time, we can also set that equal to this constant. We're saying it's, it's going to happen. If given enough time, enough of these decays will occur. Okay? Finally, half-life is that time. Sometimes it's called half-life, sometimes it's called T sub one-half, right? Sometimes it's just T. Um, but it's the time required for the activity of a given radioactive sample to decrease to half of its initial value. And so we'll call it, and I'm sorry these slides didn't import into this app uh, correctly, but this would be like A sub zero, right? So A sub zero is that initial activity. It's the activity at time zero. All right, now I'm going to show you kind of the caveman way of doing this. So I gave you all those formulas, and I've said that they're kind of giving us some kind of exponential decay um, process. And so typically, this exponential decay process is indicated by this formula. And let me, again, this didn't import quite correctly. So we're talking about A at some time, activity at some given amount of time, two hours from now, right, equals the activity at that initial amount of time, A sub zero, times an exponent, E, right, this guy, and it's going to be to the negative decay constant times that time, right? So we're going to need to know the amount of time we're talking about, and then we'll need to know that decay constant. So we'll, 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 look, we'll work some math problems related to this stuff. I know it seems kind of foggy. Um, but I want to relate it to the way that I learned how I finally figured out this stuff, right, as an x-ray tech. So when we're talking about this um, uh, e to the negative lambda t kind of stuff, right, um, another way of writing this formula out is t one-half equals the natural log of 2 divided by that decay constant, right? That's an interesting formula. It's actually in your packet. This formula is important enough that I've included it in your packet. 
as well as some steps for how to arrive at it. The way that I think about this as an x-ray tech, and so some of the x-ray techs in the room might be thinking, what does this have to do with me? Well, it's the exact same thing as a half value layer. Only now instead of a duration of time, we're talking in about a duration of material. Right? It's the exact same thing. So natural log of 2, ln2, divided now by some kind of linear attenuation coefficient, mu. Right? Either way you slice it, you're going to have to memorize one of these formulas. If you're a nuke med, you definitely need to know this T1 half stuff. If you're an x-ray tech, you definitely need to know the half value layer stuff. Okay? So, knowing that, um, one of the goofy ways that I remember this, I don't know if I've shared this with y'all, is this is the worst mnemonic ever. Okay, I'll tell you that right now. It's a terrible mnemonic. It's horrible, but this is the way I remember it. Because the more you talk about exponents, especially, like, if, if you want to make a girl leave, right? If, you, if you're out on a date and you want to get rid of your date, just start talking about exponents. Because the longer you talk about exponents, the more likely that girl is to leave, right? Um, that's, that's the truth. Learn the hard way. Like, hard knocks of life. But um, if you're then depressed after that date and you need to have a laugh, Right? This is seriously the way I remember this. HVL, have a laugh, right? You can remember the natural log of 2 is Saturday Night Live, right? I like Saturday Night Live. Hopefully, y'all do too. But the natural log of 2 is just 0 0.693. Where did I get Saturday Night Live from that? 6 starts with an S, it, it, 9 starts with an N, and then there's three of them in Saturday Night Live, so I just add the L in myself. That's the way I remember the stupid formula, okay? So they are the exact same formula, right? But this is just a dumb way to remember it. The natural log of 2 is Saturday Night Live, 0.693. Okay, why am I talking about all that stuff when I said there's like a caveman way of doing this? There is a caveman way of doing this, and it's exact same whether you're talking about half-lives or half-value layers, okay? Um, Here's the caveman math for it. Let's say I've got some amount of activity equal to 100. After it goes through one half-life, how much of it will I have? 50. After it goes through another half-life, how much of it will I have? 25. Yes. I can't remember what the loss. 7.25? No, wait. 6.25. Couldn't remember it. Yeah. So this is pretty much all you need to know about half-lives and half-value layers for the x-ray folks, okay? If you know this much, you're doing pretty darn good, right? Um, it is helpful, though, to understand at the same time, it's, we're not talking about these nice, neat, round numbers when we're talking about ra uh, radiopharmaceuticals. They have their own little special thing that they're doing. The other thing about this is it's like this graph is showing us, it's going to get pretty darn close to zero without actually ever being zero. So very often, physics to, folks in the physics department will assume some number of half-lives. They will call that an infinitesimal amount of half-lives, or there's now very, very little left of what initially was the activity. Sometimes it's, it's normally six or more half-lives. Um, I think in our, in our PBL, it's ten half-lives. Okay, let's apply all this that we've learned so far to figuring out what a patient's dose might be from exposure to a radiopharmaceutical. Um, so internal dose can never be directly measured because then we would have to somehow insert Geiger counters and stuff inside of people's bodies, which is impossible, right? What we do is we calculate it, and we calculate it based on inserting ion chambers inside of phantoms that act like people's bodies. So they attenuate things like people's bodies, and then we make measurements based on that. It's a fairly elaborate and complex process. But for our purposes here, these calculations are going to be based on two factors. One of them is the physical factors that we just talked about. The fact that this stuff has radioactive half-life, it gives off certain types of energy through these decay processes. 
but we'll call those the physical factors. The other thing is biological factors, right? So this is like the patient's throughput of, for example, urine or anything that might excrete a radiopharmaceutical that's inside their body, right? So sweat, the ways that the body gets rid of this stuff, okay? And so the fancy word for that, well, it's twofold. There's going to be a distribution of the radiopharmaceutical through their body. So, for example, when I inject someone with I-131, it traces all through their body until it eventually winds up concentrating in their thyroid. There's going to be portions of it that never make it to their thyroid, right? Um, then, in addition to that, it has these kinetic behaviors, right, um, like absorption rate, turnover rates, and retention times that are how the body is processing this molecule or this atom, right? One example of how this might look is if you can imagine you had a ladle or maybe a fire hose full of radioactive water, right? And you're going to pour that radioactive water into a barrel, right? So the radioactive water is radioactive. It's giving off whatever kind of radiation we've put in the water. But the barrel is like the human body. And if you can imagine, it has some holes in it, things where the water leaks out. So we're talking about the half-life of that radioactive water plus the biological half-life of the water draining, draining out of the barrel. And so that's what we're talking about when we talk about an effective half-life, right? So it's very similar to like an effective dose, right? We're trying to combine both these two factors and to have some kind of estimate of what, how long this stuff will be in the body and how much energy it will deposit in the body while it's there. So the two factors, again, for effectual, effective half-life is in situ... So that just means in the body, right, radioactive decay of the radionuclide, which I said is a stochastic process, completely random process. And then the biological elimination of the radionuclide, which is an organic process. It's part of just how the body works. And so this effective half-life can never be greater than the shorter of either the biological or the radioactive half-life, right? So, for example, if my body eliminates this stuff at a rate of however much per minute, right, the half-life of this effective half-life cannot be more than that elimination rate, right? If the half-life of the radiopharmaceutical happens to be really short, the effective half-life cannot be longer than that. So what we're talking about is a committed dose. Right? And this is from an ICRP document. I'll go ahead and read the whole thing out. Radionuclides incorporated into the human body irradiate tissues over time periods determined by their physical half-life and their biological retention within the body. Thus, they may give rise to doses to body tissues for many months or years after intake. The need to regulate exposures to radionuclides in the accumulation of radiation doses over extended periods of time has led to the definition of a committed dose quantity. So this committed effective dose is what we're going to use when we're talking about occupational exposures to this stuff. Right? And again, you can be grateful because it's really just an estimate. We're doing a calculation based on what we know about biological throughput, as well as the tissue weighting factors of different tissues that may have been exposed, as well as the half-life of the internal nuclide, right? So it is very similar, again, to that effective dose, but we are talking about the patient is going to get this whole dose over a period of time. They may not get it all at once. It, it may be 30 years from now before the, we can say that they've received the entire dose. So again, with the Samarium 153, we've said its half-life is one days and some change, about two days, right? Anyone who was exposed internally to that 
and it can get through skin, right, is going to get that full dose, right, however much of it sticks around in their body. So the committed effective dose is the sum of the products of the committed organ and tissue equivalent doses and the appropriate tissue weighting factors. So there's that W sub T again, right? And so in this case, um, the E to the T here, T is just the time in years it takes to get that full dose, right? Or with the case of samarium, it, it might not be years, it might be days. So the committed dose period is taken to be 50 years for adults and age 70 years for children, right? What is that saying? They've had to, again, estimate certain things. If someone is exposed internally to uranium, they are not going to use the half-life of uranium to figure out what their committed dose is, right? They're going to use 50 years if that person was an adult or 70 years if that person was a child because that's pretty much the length of time they could possibly be alive with this uranium inside their body, right? That's going to be how they calculate their committed dose. So, in similar to the effective dose that we've talked about previously in this class, the committed dose is used to demonstrate compliance with dose limits. So, for nuclear medicine technologists and the exposed public, this is how we're going to report the dose of record. Okay? All right, well, let's talk a little about these medical internal radiation doses, or MERDs, okay? Again, what we're talking about is another big book of different types of measurements, right? So this is not anything that you would memorize. I just want you to be familiar with this terminology, okay? Um, it's a big book, or it's even computer programs, like our reading talked about how there's computer programs that can simulate and do this kind of computation for us also. It was developed by the Society of Nuclear Medicine to standardize a method of calculating internal dose. So what we've said is there's no way to measure this. It's impossible to measure internal dose. We can only calculate it. And so it's essential for us to have some standard, recognized standards for how we calculate things. The one that's the most important to you is the MERD, okay? Are there other ways to calculate it? Yes, there are. There's the ICRP's way. There's a lot of different ways to calculate this thing. But the one I want you to be familiar with is this one. In this case, the dose equals the energy absorbed in that tissue of interest divided by the mass of that tissue. Right? And again, this is arrived at using phantoms that simulate the patient's body. So the MERD divides the body into source organs and target organs. So anytime we're figuring out a MERD, we will have to define, this is the target organ I want to know about, right? So for in the instance of, and we do this all the time in radiation therapy and in nuclear medicine, anytime we're giving uh, thyroid injections or brachytherapy, this is the kind of calculation that they're doing. They're saying, what's the target organ? Oh, it's the thyroid, or, or oh, it's the prostate, okay? We're going to put this radioactive source this close to the prostate, and we may do that by injecting it into the patient. We may do that by implanting it in the patient, but we're going to put it internally very close to that target, right? We may use pharmacokinetic processes to target that, and that's what they're talking about a lot of times when they talk about molecular therapy, right? Take a molecule that this organ digs, right? Make it radioactive, and now that organ's going to uptake that, that molecule and be radiated, right? So we'll need to define what our target organ is. So let's talk about thyroids, okay? We will inject the patient with iodine-131. Why? Because the thyroid likes iodine, right? So these thyroid injections were probably the, the very first um, molecular therapy injections that I can think of, unless I'm, am, am I wrong about that? I think that's true. I know that they were doing them as early as the 1950s. Um, so now our target is the thyroid, 
the source is also the thyroid, right? But could we define other targets? Yes, we could. We could say, well, the thyroid's also quite close to, for example, the eyes. What is the dose that the eyes are getting from the thyroid now as a source, right? Or what is the dose that the heart is getting, the heart being the target, with, again, the thyroid as the source? So we've highly simplified this, right, into just targets and sources, and we can do these calculations fairly rapidly to figure out what would be a dose that would be delivered internally. So here are five steps to how that would occur. And the reason I include this here is I'm not going to ask you to do MERD calculations. We're not going to get that nerdy in here. Do you need to know how to find a half-life on a chart and then calculate um, a decay constant? Yes, you do. Yeah, I think that's something we can all learn how to do. Do you need to understand how a, a half-life is similar to a half-value layer? Yes, you do. Do you need to know the natural log of 2? Yes, you do. Right? All of those things, yes, those are calculations I would expect you to do. Right? This is kind of taking us to the next level just so that we can have a robust appreciation for why we shouldn't be using the PET CT bathroom, but then also to have a better understanding of what the PBL is asking us and why, if there is a radioactive spill, we want to stay the heck away from it. Right? Because if the stuff gets inside of you, guess what? Now they're doing the calculations to figure out what the target and sources are inside of your own body. Right? And it can get through your skin. It can if, if any part of you gets wet from an uncontained source, chances are it will get into your body. Right? That's just how the body works. Okay. So what they would then have to do is determine the biological distribution and effective half-life of that nuclide. How quickly is your body going to eliminate it? And what is the half-life of the pharmaceutical, right? Then they're going to look at the rate of energy emitted by that nuclide to the source organs. So they're going to have to define a whole bunch of different source organs for your body. I'm interested in, for example, breast tissue. I'm interested in prostate. I'm interested in eyes. I'm interested in gonads. All of those things that are, um, have an increased radio sensitivity, okay? Now I've got to calculate the fraction of emitted energy that may have been incident on any one of those target organs. Okay? So I'm going to treat the entire body as a source of radiation and calculate doses to each one of those targets. And then I've got to divide the energy to the target by the organ mass in order to get that final number. What is the size of the organ that was irradiated by that source? It's a fairly Simple compared to like how complicated these processes truly are, but it is also a, you know, it's a unified way. We've become quite accustomed to this, and so now we just have big books that tell us all this information, right? Because they've just thrown it into computers, and the computer can tell you different MERDs giving different things. We can throw in patient weight or age and also come out with different answers too.